self care. Morning, everybody. Um, so we, we had to do that twice so you could hear us. <coughs> um, uh, I'm going to talk to you about a couple of things this morning, and uh, I, I, uh, I'll tell you it's a, uh, Paul Nakasone is a difficult act to follow, um, but he said a lot of important things, and some of those things are going to be threaded into to what I talk about because we are, as he said a couple of times, uh, tightly connected with what NSA and U.S. Cyber Command are doing through, through CISA. Uh, as we as we develop this this new agency, um, so uh, I, I have about a 30 minute 35 minute presentation that I'm going to jam into an hour, uh, and what that means for you is that I'm going to probably get down on the floor and walk around and put a couple of you on the spot and ask you questions, and I also would like for you to ask me questions as we go along, so don't hesitate to say you have a question. You can raise your hand if you feel like you're still in third grade. That's okay. Um, and I'll try to do my best to answer the question. If I can't answer the question now, I'll go find answers and I'll get back to you. Is that fair? Okay, so um, the first thing I got to do is make sure I know how to drive this thing. Yay, I do. The first thing is a shameless plug for DHS as a cyber talent hiring. And I can see some youngsters right in here who might be interested in the long run, so very good, welcome. Um, there is a, a booth from CISA at, uh, at uh, number 42 over in, the, um, over in the exposition area. Please stop by and, and learn a little bit more if you're interested. Uh, the career fair happened yesterday, but that doesn't mean you can't get connected with career stuff today. Um, and so there are a number of uh, CISA and DHS folks running around uh, go to that booth. If you can't find anybody, come back and find me, and I'll put you in touch with the right people if you have some interest in that. Um, a lot of the things that General Nakasone said this morning uh, about partnership and about talent development and, and, uh, and the growth of the workforce, the retention of the workforce, the training of the workforce, all of those things apply um, equally to DHS and CISA, although not at, uh, at the same scale. I mean, he's got 40,000 employees. We have 3,800, a little bit of a difference there. Um, a, lot of, a, lot of, uh, a lot of factors that, that go into that, but, but the bottom line is that we're all looking for good talent. We're all looking for talent. That, that hunt for talent is a, is a regular and enduring thing that we, we do all the time. So if you are interested, or if you know somebody who's interested, please get, uh, get linked in with us. End of shameless plug. So I'm going to talk about a couple of things today. I'm going to talk about what we are. Uh, we find in a lot of cases that we don't, well, well, when we're dealing with people, they don't really understand what CISA is. So I'm going to explain a little bit about what that is, what that means. Um, I'm going to also make sure that I don't miss any of the points that my, my folks put together, together for me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Um, and I'm going to talk about the best practices in thinking through risk. I think, you know, there's a, there's a point that was made this morning by a couple of the different speakers that, that talked to us about partnerships and about co collaboration and about cooperation. Uh, and, and CISA is about developing partnerships, cultivating those partnerships, utilizing those partnerships to be effective in what we do, not just for our mission's sake, but for your mission's sake as well, whether you're state, local government, whether you're private sector, critical infrastructure or otherwise, all of those play into sort of what we do and how we, how we want to interact with you to make sure that we provide the best service that we can. And I'll talk a little bit about what our mission is from a mission essential perspective and how that fits in with the private sector and all the other partners that we, um, that we participate with. Um, our, our, uh, we'll talk about strategic goals. We'll talk about the things that are uh, important in what we do. Uh, one thing I do want to point out, uh, if you take a look at that picture at the bottom right-hand side of the slide, what does that mean to you? And I think in the context of what the Attorney General was talking about this morning, um, we have a significant portion of our population who is at risk because they don't understand what's going on. They don't do cyber. General Knox, Sony's parents still use a flip phone. 
but that doesn't mean that they're any less susceptible to uh, bad guys, taking stuff away from them, scamming them, fraud, all those kinds of things. So I would submit to you, number one, that if you're faster than your next door neighbor, you're gonna be able to get away from the bear and your next door neighbor may not. So that's one, make yourself faster. Make sure you understand what's going on. Two, partnerships, help your neighbor so that you can both get away from the bear, all right? So, we have all this going on. We have cyber all over the place. Everybody's got something to do with cyber. Everybody's got a great tool. Everybody's got a different little appliance that they want you to plug into your computer. And what does it look like? It looks like some eight-year-olds playing soccer, doesn't it? Everybody's, you, you always know where the ball is in an eight-year-old soccer game, don't you? Well, how can you tell? There's either a crowd, or there's a cloud of dust, or both. And in, in, in some respects, the way I look at cyber, we, we're there right now. And, and the thing that concerns me is that we're, we might not all be rushing to the right place. We might be rushing to a place that isn't the right place. I won't say the wrong place but a place that isn't the right place. How do we define what the right place is? And we'll talk a little bit about that. And if, as I'm talking about this, think back on what the Attorney General said this morning. And think back a little bit about what General Nakasone said about the partnerships that we need to have, the focus on um, doing things the right way, good cyber hygiene, basic blocking, tackling, all that kind of stuff. Um, so so let's, let's see if we can grow as eight-year-olds are wont to do, when they become 18-year-olds, there's no longer this rush to the ball. There's no longer a crowd around the ball. There's no longer a cloud of dust because we've matured their capability to play that game, whether you call it soccer or football, it doesn't matter. It's the same game. Um, so how can, we, how can we train? How can we develop? How can we grow our population, our workforce, to not do that? Think about that for a second. And there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of different ways to take a look at that. So, as CISA, we, we are the nation's risk advisors. We lead the national risk management discussion. That's our objective. And what does that mean? You know, we can talk about risk all the time. We can talk about risk all day long. Do, does, does CISA understand risk in its totality? I submit to you that we do not. We understand a part of the risk. I can't really understand the risk that the Department of Commerce has without having a commerce partner help me understand what it is. I certainly can't understand what risk is in the context of a private sector business, an electric utility, uh, a company that makes widgets, um, a service company, doesn't really matter. What, what's the number one thing that those companies use to judge their risk? Who knows? Come on, not that hard. What, uh, let me phrase the question a little bit differently. What's the purpose of those entities? What, what, did I hear that? Who said it? Make money. Absolutely. Make money. So it's very difficult for a governmental organization to assess risk in the context of a thought about the bottom line, isn't it? What does that mean? That means that we have to bring those partners in so that we understand how they calculate that risk. And how does that risk apply to the way we look at risk and understanding of risk in terms of national critical functions, for example. What are the downstream effects of a water treatment plant in Tampa that goes out because you had a storm or because you had a, a cyber incident? What happens? You might not get water. You might have sewers backed up. You might have all those kinds of things. We understand that physical impact and that risk, but what does it mean to either the municipality or the shareholders of that entity when that kind of an event occurs. 
we, we, we understand intuitively, yep, it's bad, but we don't understand it down to a granular, granular level where we can make a, um, a comparison of cost versus risk. So part of what we want to do as the nation's risk advisors is take a look at these four things from our perspective, and I'll talk about the four things in a second, and bring partners in to help us understand their element of risk compared to those four things that are on that slide. So the first one's kind of easy because our, uh, one of our major uh, functions is federal network protection. I used to run the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center, and, I, and, and people will always say, well, we're, you're doing, you're doing um, cyber defense for X, Y, and Z. No, we're not. We don't do cybersecurity. We help you do it better. Our job is not to defend your networks. Our job is to provide you information. General Noxoni is talking about this. At unclassified level, if we can, from our piece of the pie, what do we see? What can we bring to the table that will help you do federal network protection better? We have programs called Einstein. We have the CDM program, Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation. We have Automated indicator sharing, all these programs come together and provide information so the defenders that are on the ground in the federal networks have a better sense of what's going on in their networks and how they can better defend those networks. So that's, that's part of the first part of the, the risk, um, risk equation. The second one is emergency communications. So if you recall, some of you probably weren't born um, on 9-11. But what was the biggest problem that the police and fire services in New York City had on 9-11? Comms. They couldn't talk to each other, right? Police are on one set of frequencies, fire's on another set of frequencies. Oh, by the way, the culture in the police department in New York and the fire department in New York is pretty different, too. Um, I won't say either one of them is bad. They're not. They're, they're great organizations. But they have that, you know, that typical police fire head knocking every now and then. And so by, by default, they had these two communications issues that, that they just couldn't talk to each other. We learned from that, thankfully. A lot of other lessons were learned on 9-11, but that was one of the big ones. And this emergency communications group that is part of CISA is focused on that. How do we make sure that police, fire, EMS, public services, whatever, in state and local partners can talk to each other when it's important for them to be able to talk to each other. And if you don't, how do you understand the risk? Are you willing to accept risk of not being able to talk to each other or not being able to talk to the jurisdiction that's next to you that you're gonna to have to count on if you're overloaded by, well, today. We have two giant wildfires going on in California. Don't you think there's the need in those instances for police, fire, EMS, and public service to be able to talk to each other. And particularly if you think about it from this perspective, you have a fire of 70,000 acres and you probably have at least three cell towers in that area that don't function because the comps providers will turn them off because if they don't, they'll really get trashed. Um, so you can't count on cell phones to talk to each other. Emergency communications helps understand that risk before an event happens. Bring partners together to sort out and understand what those risks are for uh, both jurisdictional jumps and internally. That's, that's what they do. Um, comprehensive cyber protection. I, and I don't really like that word because we're not protecting what, well, like I said earlier, we're helping you understand your environment. We're helping you understand the environment that's out there so that you know what the risks and the threats might be. Um, there's discussion this morning from a couple of different other speakers about the elections. Significant amount of potential for mischief, particularly by nation state actors, to cause, cause our citizenry to not necessarily have full faith and confidence in our voting system. Part of our job is to help un understand what that risk is and figure out ways to mitigate it. Some of the greatest talent in the country is, in fact, 
the intelligence community and the folks that are help us get ahead of that. And I, uh, you know, the uh, Ann Newberger's next door talking about cybersecurity division. One of the things that they're going to do is just like the general said this morning. How do we get that information down to an unclassified level so that we can share it rapidly and effectively? And that means two things. That means working through that process. It also means developing the partners that you trust that you can share that information with. Oh, and by the way, if you're going to develop partnerships, when's the time to do it? Way ahead of time. Way ahead of time. You know, I used to work for a guy called Thad Allen, and you might remember him from the television for Katrina and for Deepwater Horizon. But one of his favorite sayings is, it doesn't do us any good to share business cards in the middle of a disaster. So develop the partnerships early, uh, and then you're not gonna have that, that issue where you're trying to meet somebody, understand who they are, understand what their capabilities are, all the while you're trying to sort out a, a fire or a cyber breach or an oil spill. Um, the last bit is infrastructure resilience and field operations. So uh, I have a vested interest in this. The field forces of CISA in our regions, protective security advisors, cybersecurity advisors, emergency communications uh, advisors, all are part of our organization. And they're working every single day with state and local partners to understand things like physical risk, cyber risk, communications risk. And how do you, how do you put together uh, the community, whether it's a community in a city, or whether it's a community across a couple of counties, or a statewide community, to be able to talk to each other, to be able to communicate with each other, and oh, by the way, in the same language. Sometimes it's difficult. Cyber people talk a different language than the comms people do. Emergency, emergency managers talk a way different language than the cyber folks do. We learned that yesterday in the exercise, right? Um, there's, there's that difficulty that we've got to work through. And the partnerships that you develop can help us mitigate some of those challenges that we have. So CISA as an agency, the nation's risk advisors, and the, the, uh, we'll talk about four of the mission essential functions that support those things that I just talked about. Number one, incident management. Bad things happen. Fires, floods, oil spills, cyber events, our job is to help understand that, help bring people together to work through the, the, the management of that incident to mitigate it with as least, the least amount of damage possible um, through a number of different partnerships, through a number of different skill sets, uh, and, and that's, that's the, the big one. And the way, the way I believe that we succeed is developing those partnerships now. Um, sort of what we do on a regular daily basis is meet with state and local officials. What are your issues? What are your problems? What are the things we can help you understand? And so forth. Um, so that's, that's number one. Number two, analysis. Two sides of the equation here. One side, pretty obvious, analysis of cyber incidents. Analysis of what the threat is, what the uh, attack surface is, what the event has just caused to happen, and how did that cause it to happen? You know, forensic analysis, incident response, out you go, collect the data, bring it back in, turn it over quickly. By the way, we're not turning it over only in CISA, we're turning it over with our partners, so we have access to law enforcement and intelligence community information that helps us provide a much more fulsome picture of what's happened from an analysis perspective. We're also looking at analysis on the physical side. So if you think about, um, mo this is not a great example, but it's a, a little bit instructive. Think about El Paso and Dayton and the shootings recently. Predominantly a law enforcement issue, right? But our analysis of those situations helped us think through what could we have done better to prepare the secretary of DHS had a big emphasis on understanding the beginnings of, of um, homegrown terrorists because a lot of the homegrown terrorist stuff manifested in some of those shooting incidents. So analysis of those kinds of events so that 
once we do the analysis, analysis and we learn what happened, we can put that into a format that state and local folks can use to make adjustments in their process and procedures. We provide that analysis because there's not the capacity at the state and local level, for example, to be able to do that in all cases. You know, it's kind of hard, it would be kind of hard for a, a police department in Bozeman, Montana to do an analysis surrounding the El Paso shooter, don't you think? Because the police department in Bozeman, Montana has probably got about four people in it. You get where I'm coming from, right? This is some of the analysis that we can provide to help people prepare for and understand the risk that's going to be a part of their daily lives. Second, third thing, capacity building. This is a big deal. This is assessments. This is exercises. This is training. This is awareness of all those things across all levels of government and the private sector. Um, I think two weeks time, there's a big exercise called GridX, which brings in the um, uh, electric utilities, um, electricity generation, electricity transmission, ele electricity distribution, and they're all different. Um, what happens when we have a bad day in the grid nationwide? And oh, by the way, what happens in this country if power goes out? You get people who get pretty cheesed off, don't they? And they get cheesed off if power's out for an hour. Think about it if power's out for a week. What's going to happen? Think about power out for a month. What are we going to do? What's going to happen? I'll tell you one thing you won't be able to do after about the first week. You won't be able to use these. At least you won't be able to use them as widely because those cell phone towers require power. And you can't put a generator at every one of those cell towers to operate the cell system because A, don't have enough generators to do that, and B, you gotta fuel them. And there's not that much fuel distribution to go around to be able to support an event like that, right? So all, all those things occur, how do we build capacity to get around that when we have a bad day with the electric grid? And then the second part of that, all right, we've talked about how we do these things. How do you train your people? How do you develop your people? What's the, who can tell me what the next step is when you get there? What do you have to do next? I got a process and procedure. I'm ready to go. I'm ready for the worst thing that could possibly happen on that day. What's the next thing you got to do? Test it. How do you test it? <laughs> he says, make the grid go down. I'm not sure I'd want to do that. So one step short of that, what's, what's, the, what's the best way to test it? Have an exercise. And by the way, I think we need to change the way we view exercises generally. I won't point any fingers. What should you be doing in an exercise? Testing your procedures, like the, like the gentleman back there said. But you should be testing those procedures to a level of failure. Why? Who can tell me why? Let me say it a different way. I want to exercise the heck out of you until I, until I cause you to, to fall apart, to make a mistake, to do something silly. Why would I do that? It, well, two, two things. Reality, fact. Second thing, because then you learn what you got to fix. You learn where you need to do some more training or some more development. You know, this is something that's, that's grown into folks that grew up in the military. I spent 30 years in the Coast Guard. Very proud of that fact. But every time we did an exercise, we exercised to failure. Why? Because we want to learn where the holes are. We want to learn, is there a better way to do it? And it's a, it's a time to do it. It's, it's not necessarily stress-free, but you're allowed to fail. And failure has no consequence because it's an exercise. So it's important to keep that in mind. At the state and local level, we, you know, we have all these, we have these exercises going on all the time. And, and it's important to understand, we're not trying to make you look bad. We're not trying to, you know, change your report card. The idea is to exercise so you get to a point where, hey, we've learned some things, let's make some things better. Last one, um, information exchange. And this was a big deal that 
both uh, General Naxoni talked about and the Attorney General talked about. How do we share information? And I think, I think um, the General said it really quite well. That, you know, we, we, we see this part of the world, but we have to bring on our, par our partners to see different slices of that pie to try to grow a full picture of what, what really is, to be, to be better at understanding the whole thing. Uh, and that's one of the things that we, we strive to do. We're, we're doing similar things that, that he was talking about with the partnerships with the Brits. We, we've had those standing partnerships with them, uh, all the Five Eyes partners, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, UK, and, and several others, the, the players you might su suspect, the Singaporeans, the Japanese, um, the French, the Germans, uh, the Scandinavian countries, the, the Baltic states. Uh, all of those partnerships are at different levels, but they're critical and, and they see they see things a lot of times from a different perspective than we see, and they see it sometimes before we see it. Great example, WannaCry. Who knows what WannaCry was? Raise your hand. Yep. How do you think we found out about it? You know who told us? The Brits. Because it was one of those follow the sun things. Who told the Brits? The Finns. Right? Great example of how you develop a partnership before something bad happens. Pick the phone up, call. Hey, I'm seeing this, what are you seeing? Our 24-7 our, uh, Watt Center has two calls a day at 6.30 and 6.30 with all the cyber centers in the federal government so that we all share what are we working on now, what's at the top of the hit parade for our respective agency heads, and what are we seeing related to those things that are at the top of the hit parade. So this information exchange is critical to success. And by the way, I don't call it information sharing anymore. I call it exchange. Why do I do that? It's a two-way exchange. Absolutely. It can't be, hey, I'm here from the government. Here you go. It's got to be, I got all this. You got all that. How do we put it together and make some sense of it? And that's a part of the development of the partnerships, too, that I think is really, really important. So the Attorney General talked about what I think is a change of culture in our nation. How do we become more responsible as cyber citizens? And how do we help those that are a little behind us, as you might expect, like Paul Noxoni's parents, they're 90 years old, they use flip phones. My mom had a flip phone. Never, ne never had that thing. Whenever she wanted to do her Facebook or whatever, she was on a a desktop, she's more comfortable doing that. But how do, we, how do we educate our citizens to be safe and to not do silly things? What's the number one problem we have from a cyber perspective in terms of uh, a challenge? What's the number one problem to, to, that causes cyber events to happen? Click. click, yeah, you know what it is? What, who clicks? People. So if you look at it like this, you got all this data security stuff on one, in one corner, and you got Dave in the other corner. And Dave is gonna do something stupid. He is, promise. He's gonna click on something he shouldn't click on, and then bad things are gonna happen. So how do we do that? How do we change that culture? So this year, National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, um, is a focus on people and personal responsibility. Just exactly what the Attorney General said when she was talking. How do we get people to think like that? And by the way, how do we get people to think like that when we have a generation of baby boomers that are, well, how old are we now? Um, 55 and above. That not all of us, and I'm one, not all of us, are switched on to the challenges that are presented to us every day when we use one of these. Or when we're working at our desk. How do we do that? So National Cybersecurity Awareness Month is focused on own it, secure it, protect it. Those are the things that, well, the old DHS model of see something, say something, 
This is the next extension of that as it applies to cyber and as it applies, as it applies to developing some personal responsibility as we're using the great tools that our innovators across the, the nation and around the world have provided for us. These great tools that we have, these great, these wonderful things you can put in your hand, everything, you get the world at your fingertips. You guys don't have to do homework. You can look it up on Google. I had to go find an encyclopedia, figure out which volume to use, figure out how to use the index to find it in the right volume. You can just say, well, I want to know about this. Boop, there it is. How do, we, how do we get people to think about owning it, securing it, and protecting it? And so that's one of the big things that, that Cybersecurity Awareness Month is focused on. It's focused on personal responsibility. You're responsible for it. I'm not responsible for it as the government. Your mom and dad are not responsible for it, although they have a piece of it because they're teaching you how to be good citizens. They're teaching you how to be good Americans. They're teaching you how to be good people, but they also have a responsibility to make sure that you don't get wrapped into something really silly online. And, and, and by the way, your mom and dad love you and they protect you. They want to protect you. That's their job. So how do, we, how do we get people to think about this from a personal responsibility writ large, globally? Um, the other thing that I think you need to keep in mind, and, and this is sort of an aside, but it's really an important aside, and that is this is, a, this is about privacy. How can we... We have a, a culture of wanting to keep things private in this country. Well, at least baby boomers do. I'm not so sure about the up and coming generation because everything you do is online. I can find your profile and I can do it. I can see what you did for the last 10 minutes because it's right there. Whether you're using Instagram or Pinterest or Facebook or whatever the latest Snapchat, I got guys that can break into Snapchat and take out what you left in there that you think is gone. So how do we create this understanding of a culture of not only protecting our system-wide uh, assets, but also protecting ourselves? And it's a personal responsibility. It's, it's a shared responsibility, but it's also your personal responsibility to do that. Um, I would commend to you the I apologize uh, that, that it's kind of hard to read, but that link at the bottom has a toolkit in it that you can go to, and there's all kinds of really cool things to do in there. Everything from how do I deal with my 90-year-old mother to how do I deal with my millennial children that are under the age of 10, and some things for you to think about, both as parents uh, and otherwise, uh, about how do we own it, secure it, and protect it. So last thing I was going to talk about is related to generally uh, cyber best practices. What are the things that we think about um, on a day-to-day -day basis? Some of the things that I would hope you would think about on a day-to-day -day basis. And we talked about this a little bit yesterday. I was here for a state and local exercise, uh, and this, this theme... Uh, came up frequently in the discussions, leadership has to own it. Think about what I just said about own it, secure it, protect it. In an organization that's doing a business or doing a government mission, leadership can no longer abdicate their responsibility to be cyber secure. They have to own the problem. They have to understand the problem. I can't say if I'm the leader of an agency, okay, CIO, off you go, handle it. Wrong answer. There has to be some ownership on the part of leaders. And we're starting to see this more and more because if you look at some of the private sector, particularly the, the big companies where they have a big board of directors, what are they doing? They create a cyber committee. They're bringing people in to the board who understand cyber. And I'm not talking about ones and zeros. I'm not talking about hands on keyboard. I'm talking about how does cyber impact our ability to make money? How does cyber impact our ability to deliver the services that we deliver that cause us to make money? And how do I translate those things like vulnerability management to leadership so they understand it. We got to do that because if we don't, we are at substantially higher risk of not being able to make money. 
and people stealing our intellectual property. So at the end of the day, you can see these folks at the board level, at the CEO level, at the whatever level who's at the top of the pyramid need to own it. They need to know about it. They need to understand it. <clears throat> um, at dinner last night, uh, General Noxoni was talking about when he showed up at uh, Fort Meade to take over a, a SIGINT role. Um, he was about a month after I got there. Um, I, I'm, and I remember we, we had, we've lived some of the same experiences. The big one was General Alexander creating U.S. Cyber Command and making sure that it fit into the larger NSA CSS structure. How could we take advantage of the great intelligence capability that NSA has through the partnerships and the talent that they have on board? Um, but one thing General Alexander used to say, <clears throat> if you do this, good cyber hygiene, basic blocking and tackling, patching, what a novel concept. I understand in some cases you might not patch because patches break things. But you need to understand, back to leadership needs to own, you need to understand what the impact of that patch is, and if it breaks something, how can you fix it? Or, mm, I'm not going to fix it, I'm not going to patch it, I'm going to accept that risk, because the patch is down here. But if you do basic patching, basic cyber hygiene, awareness campaigns for your employees, so your employees become not a part of the problem like Dave, but a part of the solution, General Alexander, you say 80% of your problems are going to go away because you've taken the right steps. And I don't care if you, I don't care if you use the NIST framework. I don't care if you use the 20 critical controls. It doesn't matter. Use something as a framework to do basic cyber hygiene. If you do that, 80%, more or less. But you're along the way. And by the way, think back to that slide where the bear's chasing the one guy. If you're at 80 and your neighbor's at 40, the, the bear's probably going to get the neighbor at 40, not you. Risk management. What can you accept? Go back to the patching equation. I have to balance security by doing the patch against the mission, the ability to do business, the ability to deliver social security checks. Um, so that's a, that's a balancing act of risk. And we need to start thinking about what we do more in terms of that and less in terms of you must. You must be in compliance because compliance doesn't get us all the way there. It, it's important that we get the people that are a part of this equation to, uh, to understand what's going on. Be prepared. We talked about it earlier. Exercise. Exercise to failure. Exercise, exercise, exercise. Do it. You have to. You have to understand what's going to happen. You have to understand how people are going to think when they're having a bad day. And what do we do about it if they're having a bad day? And you're going to make changes to your procedures based upon exercises. This doesn't work. It didn't work for the last three exercises. Why haven't we changed it yet? So you've got to have that thought process as you're going through the exercises. Here's the one that, this is the one I think is really relevant to the private sector. It, it's, it applies across the board, but really to the private sector. How do you defend your networks when you're having a bad day and still continue to operate? Have you thought through that? Have you exercised that? You know, if you, you, the electric grid is really easy to understand because people around here have been without power, ever, you know, sporadically. How, how do you continue to generate, transmit, and distribute electricity when you're in the middle of a cyber event. Have you thought through how you're going to do that? Now, the electric companies in this country have done a pretty good job of that. They have cooperative agreements across the board, whether they're little municipalities or they're biggies, like Duke and Southern and Western Power and all those. They've thought through what we're going to do. If we have a bad day here, how do we reroute traffic? How do we shift generation? All those kinds of things are a part of the equation. You need to do that in your business. You need to think about, what am I going to do to continue to operate at the same time I'm defending my network? Oh, and by the way, I might be picking up some pieces because we just had a cyber event in Paducah that's part of our enterprise. Think through that. Exercise that. Set your procedures in place. Follow those procedures. That'd be a good idea. 
Lastly, leverage relationships. Every single one of the speakers this morning talked about the partnerships, whether they're, the, whether they're USF partnerships, Cyber Florida partnerships, NSA partnerships, uh, Florida Attorney General partnerships, develop those partnerships early, before a disaster. Know who you can trust. Know who you can pick the phone up and say, hey, what are you seeing? Can you help me with this? And know that that person on the other end of the line is going to be able to help you, or at least is going to try. So if you do all of those things, if you do all of those things well, you're going to put yourself in a pretty good spot. You're going to make your own luck. You know, luck doesn't just happen. I'm convinced. You can make your own luck. You can make it so that you're in the best position possible. It requires effort. It requires you to do all the things that we've talked about this morning. It requires you to think about all those things that General Nakasone and the Attorney General talked about. But we can make our own luck. So the big question here is, in this Cybersecurity Awareness Month, where personal responsibility in cyber is at the forefront, do you feel lucky? Have you done those things that you think you need to do that we've talked about here this morning? Do you feel lucky? Do you? <laughs> now, you don't all know who that is. I know you guys don't. That's Dirty Harry. He's pointing a gun at a criminal and he's asking the criminal, does he feel lucky today? Do you feel lucky? Have you done the things you want to do? Have you done the things you should do? One more shameless plug, 42 is the booth number for those job seekers. If you can't find uh, what you think you need there, find me. I'll be around for the rest of the day. Um, I appreciate very much you, you all paying attention, um, interacting. I think it's much more useful when we can have that discussion rather than having somebody from Washington talk at you. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to open it up for questions. If you have any, I, I will try to answer any question that you have. I may not have an answer, but I'll give it my best shot. Questions? Yes, sir, in the back. Speak loudly so we could hear you. Is tackling an offensive? <laughs> Good question. Um, so, two part answer. Uh, on the football field, tackling is a defensive activity. Tackling is defensive. Part two. Why aren't we going after some of these bad guys? Um, we are. The question is, how far are we willing to go? And how far is our society willing to let us go? And how far down the food chain uh, in cyber should we legally allow offensive actions to be taken? That's a, that's a topic for debate. I'll tell you, take a look at that guy that was wearing the striped pants up on the stage today and what they do where he, the organization he runs. I can promise you, there are some things going on there that would um, turn your hair gray uh, from, a, from a good perspective. They are, there are a lot of things that are being done offensively that uh, by definition aren't going to be in the public domain. The question I think where you're going is, why don't we have the ability as a private enterprise to hack back? I think that's a topic worthy of discussion, without question. And it doesn't need to necessarily be hacking back. I've always thought it would be a really kind of cool thing to do, particularly if you're trying to protect your data or you're trying to protect your documentation of, of something. Uh, it, it, to have a process where you take that documentation and you put it in some format um, that you can readily use, 
because you've got to make it easy for your users. But if it gets stolen by a bad guy, when it gets to the bad guy's place, it's going to deliver him a little goodie that says, hey, you, you shouldn't have been here. Oh, by the way, now I own you. The challenge is we have, you know, we have all kinds of legal impediments to that, and I, but, but I do think that's worth a discussion. Well, so you didn't hear this here, but I think that's pretty cool. Um, but secondly, realize that um, just because you know the IP doesn't mean you know where it's coming from. The bad guys are really good at, at IP hopping and IP spoofing, you know. So, so that's one of the challenges. You know, there's a lot of unintended consequences from, from hacking back. Now, if you want to send them a little picture of Winnie the Pooh, <laughs> I think that's pretty cool. I didn't say that, though. Um, yes, yes ma'am. Oh, yes. Yeah, we, we do. We, 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 well, so we, we have a program where we do all kinds of different assessments, but we, we, we look at assessments at, at, the, at the granular level, so a red team assessment or a phishing campaign assessment or, or, or a, we, we do assessments of OT systems um, for pipelines and airlines and water utilities and different things like that. But at the end of that assessment, um, there's a sit down with, with management and that organization. Just, these are the things we found. These are the things you can do about it. Oh, by the way, here's our booklet on best practices that include all those things that you just described. We, we regularly provide that. And, and those things are constantly being updated because we learn things from our private sector partners all the time. Oh, this is not right. You gotta, this has now evolved because now we're in a world of Linux and open source software. This has evolved past this to that. So you need to talk about this a little bit, but you've got to talk more about that because that's where the industry is going. And that's the value of that two-way partnership and that exchange of information. That's why it's important to do that. Yep. Other questions? Yes, sir. Talk about Dave. Right? Dave's my hero. <laughs> Yeah. Outside of the training, I mean, I can think of some things just because I do endpoint device protection. You know, it's like remove as many permissions as, you know, Dave needs to just get his job done. Yep. But then you get viewed as you're being restricted, stuff like that. So are the sites locking Dave down as much as possible? Yeah, so. so training Dave without over training Dave, what are some other things yeah. you can do to fix Dave? Because you spend all this money. Mm hmm. Yeah, so, so there's, that's a, that's a multi-part uh, sort of equation, right? Um, the importance of having leaders involved and owning the issues can be directly correlated to your ability to say, hey, I'm going to restrict Dave to only those things that Dave needs to do. That's where we're getting in this era, this era of zero trust. That's what zero trust is helping us get to. So... You've got, and, and you've got to be able to convey that to your workforce as, as you know, we're, we're, not here to, we're not here to hose you. We're here to help make us, as a company, um, safer. 
So we, we will provide some of that kind of advice as well. Um, I, I'll tell you a little story about um, the, the uh, last couple of years I was on active duty. I was the deputy commander of Coast Guard Cyber Command. And we were really trying to get the Coast Guard writ large, the workforce, to think about not being Dave. And so um, we hired a company to do some awareness training for us, and they did some really cool stuff. You know, a 30-second video that helps you think about, I shouldn't be plugging a thumb drive in, and uh, before, we could, before we locked out the thumb drive uh, boards. Um, so that was one thing. But the thing that really brought it home to me in terms of the ability to get the workforce attention um, in the Coast Guard, you have to sign on every day and you have to run through the whole um, banner process, right? You got to log on and the banner comes up, says consent to monitor and all that. Anybody ever read one of those banners if you're not a lawyer? Yeah, nobody. Um, but the banner showed up every day on a red screen because they were trying to get people's attention. Cool. What, how could we make that a little bit different? How could we get people to really understand, and I, I wasn't really concerned about getting them to read it, but I was concerned about um, the larger issue of getting their attention. So what I asked the, the NOC to do, our Network Operations Center, is um, on Monday morning at 0200, I would like you to change the color of that red screen to yellow. And so when everybody comes into work on Monday morning, across the Coast Guard data network, 44,000 employees, they're gonna see the banner, but it's gonna have a yellow background instead of a red one. And I was in my office at 6.30 that Monday morning, and I already had 14 emails and about five voice messages. What's going on? Why is this yellow? So I started to think, and I'm not that smart, I'm just a ship driver, right? Um, what else can we do along with that banner to help people think about not being Dave. And so we brought that to this small company that was doing this awareness stuff for us, and they built a couple other things into the equation. So it's about awareness, it's about leadership owning it, it's about changing the culture in your organization so you can do the kind of things that you wanna do. And, and getting people's attention, exactly. The other, th the other story I'll tell you is that when I worked for Hewlett Packard, we worked with a mid-sized electric utility uh, they're ho headquartered in Chicago, but most of their, um, most of their uh, clients and, and customers were in the Midwest, Iowa and Nebraska and what have you. Um, and they were very effective of changing the culture in their mid-size organization, probably had uh, 10 or 12,000 employees, to one of, hey, employees are no longer a part of the problem, they are a part of the solution. And they did it with simple stuff. They didn't do anything electronically. They had posters, they had town halls, and they changed the, the thinking in their organization so that they became, hey, this is about us. And they had some of the, these, these crusty old uh, folks that had been there for 30 years working on an uh, electric generation plant, and, and, and they got on board. I, I don't know how they did it, but, but, but what I'm saying is you can effect cultural change in your organization to get where you want to be so that you don't have a whole raft of Daves. Okay, so it, it involves some thinking. It involves a little bit of work. And by the way, that, that, that link that I had up there into the, into the toolbox, the toolkit, there's some good things in there. If you can't find anything in there, um, there's, a, there's another link on there and Erin Shipley runs that program and she'll help you find things that can help you do that, okay? Oh, yeah. If I can figure out how to make it go backwards. I should have put it at the end, too. I'm not a really good PowerPoint designer. Did I go past it? Oh, it was the, it was... That one, yeah, there you go. So, um, again, thank you for paying attention. I really, really appreciate the, the back and forth. Um, I'll be around if you want to ask other questions, but that's it. Go have lunch. <laughs>